you know, welcoming the feast in your home is a huge step already. Congratulations. Make it a habit. Make it a habit that as you welcome God and you welcome his presence and you worship God together and you receive the word in your home, you're making it strong. Okay, I, I, I need to go right away to our message. I'm going to start by saying that in the last century, there were some historians like Edward Gibbons and Carl Zimmerman and, and, and uh, Christopher Dawson who, who were researching this whole question. Why is it that in the past history over thousands of years, why is it that entire civilizations would fail? And through careful research, they found this out, a link between family life and society. Meaning to say, if family life disintegrates, then Wow, society disintegrates as well. I'll give you an example, the Roman Empire. There was a Roman philosopher as early as the first century, Seneca was his name. He started predicting the downfall of the Roman Empire. <laughs> and people at that time were scoffing at him. They were saying, are you nuts? Hello, look at the Roman Empire. Now it is. it has the most powerful army in the world. What are you talking about downfall? And Seneca explained this. Look at your family life. It's going down. I'll give you a quote from Seneca. He said, they divorce in order to remarry. They marry in order to divorce. You know what? He was right. The Roman Empire collapsed. I want you to look around you and I want you to understand, isn't this what is happening right now? They divorce in order to remarry. They marry in order to divorce. This is what's happening today. In the U.S., I'll give you some statistics from the U.S., 50% of marriages, almost 50%, end up in divorce. 60% of second marriages end up in divorce. 73% of third marriages end up in divorce. Which brings you to this lesson, listen carefully, that sometimes when, when we have marriage problems, we always point to the other person as the problem. Oh, the, the, he's the problem or she's the problem. That's why, that's why, that's why, you know? And then ultimately you realize that maybe the problem is not the other person, the problem is the inner person, and that you just bring the problem to the next relationship. I, I just wanted to say that, that there. Th those are the statistics, and it's sad. Here in the Philippines, there is no divorce as a, as a law, but marriage is now disintegrating, breaking apart more and more. And I'm, I'm looking at the statistics, the statistics of the past 12 years, whereby, this is shocking, 30% lesser weddings, marriages over the past 12 years in the Philippines. What does that mean? Young people are preferring to just living in together cohabitating than getting married. Why? Oh, so, you know, but why bother with the legalism? Why bother with the paperwork and all of that? You know, see so much separation and, you know. Just, but the problem with that is this, I'll tell you, statistics, that the chances of separation for a cohabitating, um, living in couple, I don't know, is living in still a term today? But never mind, okay. It's actually 500% more Chances of separation, 500% more than a married couple. Sad. Why? It's so easy to pack up. It's so easy to leave, walk out of the door. What am I trying to share with you? Um, when you break down marriage, when, you, when, when families collapse, you're going to see the impact on society. I'll give you three, three things that happen to countries when family life disintegrates. Number one is poverty. In the U.S., I'll give you an idea, this is very telling, that they've, they've, they've made some studies that 5% of families of complete couples, a man and a wife in a house, 5% of them are considered poor. That's according to statistics. But when you look at the U.S. and, and, and see, study households whose who, who only have single parents in the house, 30% are considered poor. Wow, think about that. And then crime, according to statistics, and this is very bothersome, the most important predictor of criminal behavior is the absence of a father in a home. Boom, 
that, 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 that's, that's, oh, fathers, I'm telling you that the problems of the world are the problems of fatherhood. And, and fathers need to grow up and take responsibility. But no, we've got fathers who are kids in adult bodies and, and, and they, they, they don't know how to take responsibility. And I, I'm, I'm really challenging all fathers to wake up. Oh, by the way, if I'm speaking to some of you right now and, and, and you're saying, oh no, there's no father in my house, brother Bo, what should I do? Number one. God is your father. Strengthen the spiritual relationship of your children to God and let him be your father. This is so crucial. And I want to thank you for attending the feast. Here's number two. Are you ready? I want you to open your small family to the bigger family, the family of families. What's that? The spiritual community, the church, and let other men become this, the, the father figures of your children. And that's that's what happens in youth ministry. That's what happens in, in, in the feast. That's what's happened in, in, in other churches and other communities where, where you just allow um, a network, a spiritual support system to be there for you. So that's that's my prayer and I hope, I hope you do that. Um, let me go to number three. Government spending increases crazy. When, when there is no family, and when families are breaking apart, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you. Um, you like my hair? Yeah, it's crazy. Okay. <laughs> you know, it's too long. Uh, hope that next Sunday it'll be short. Okay. Um, <laughs> just, just here, here it is, here it is. Um, strong families in older times provided child care, provided health care, provided pension, provided elderly care. That's true. That's what strong, close-knit families provided. But, you know, when families break apart, it's the government has to step in, and the government has now to give all sorts of things, like child care and all that. You see you see that in Western societies. And, and so it is very expensive. And then if you add bureaucracy and, and corruption, you're, you're spending trillions so this is this is what Jesus is trying to address. I, I want to go to the text now. So that was a long introduction. What what I want to share with you is what was happening at the time of Jesus when when you know Audi just spoke about the the text. So I'd, I'd like to share. I'd like to read the text again. In Matthew seven verse thirty one to thirty two, Jesus said, "You have heard the law that says." A man can divorce his wife by merely giving her a written notice of divorce. So Jesus, it's almost like it's so easy to get divorced. And then Jesus says, but I say that a man who divorces his wife, unless she has been unfaithful, causes her to commit adultery. And anyone who marries a divorced woman also commits adultery. These are tough words. What was happening in the time of Jesus? I'll explain this to you. That the Jews, compared them to other cultures around them, had supposed to be the highest standards of, for marriage. But you see, during the time of Jesus, divorce was getting to be very common and very rampant. I'll tell you why. Because there were some religious leaders who were interpreting this their law against divorce in a very loose way. I'll explain it in a while. But let me read first the, the divorce law back in the Old Testament in Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 1 and 2. Let's read. Suppose a man marries a woman, but she does not please him. Wow. And so that's so easy to just abuse. You know, she, she does not please him. What's that? Like, well, sweetheart, once upon a time, your body was, you know, extra small. Now it's extra large. You don't please me anymore. Yeah, I don't know. It's just so easy. Having discovered something wrong with her, he writes a document of divorce, hands it to her, and sends her away. Shoot from his house. When she leaves his house, she's free to marry another man. So this was the law that the religious leaders were going, going to try to interpret. But if you really look at what God wants, and this is what the prophets were trying to bring out. For example, I'll quote Malachi chapter 2 verse 16. God says, for I hate divorce. To divorce your wife is to overwhelm her with cruelty. Now let me explain the, the scenario during the time of Jesus. About 100 years before Christ, there were 
two rabbis. Um, one one is named Shammai, and the other was Hillel, and and they had different ways of interpreting the the laws, the laws of Moses, and specifically the law of divorce. This was the this was how they interpreted it. That Shammai said, the only reason for for divorcing your your spouse is adultery only. Hillel had another way of interpreting. For him, he said, oh, whatever reason, any reason will do. So Shammai and Hillel had their own followers, uh, their rabbis, and so they developed two schools of thought, the, the Shammites and the Hillelites. And so th th that was the situation then. So for, repeat, Shammai, adultery is the only reason. For Hillel, it could be, you know, you saw your wife talking to another guy on the street, aha, I'll divorce you. Or she burnt your toast in breakfast. She put too much salt for your dinner. You don't like her eyebrows anymore. Whatever, you just, you know, so whatever reason. So from that context, you'd like, you'd like, you'd think that, you know, oh, by the way, which is more popular as a, as a teaching at that time. Of course, you know, the, the Hillelites teaching. Mm, yeah, for, for whatever reason, you can divorce. So, was Jesus citing the teaching of Shammai, the interpretation of Shammai, that it's only adultery? It seems like it's because that, that's what Jesus said. But from deeper reading, perhaps not. Now, I'll tell you, I'll give you some explanations why some scholars believe, no, no, that no, he does not, he's not even siding with that. I'll tell you why. Because he, this is the Matthew reading from the Gospel of Luke and from the Gospel of Mark. When, when Jesus teaches about divorce, he does not give any reason for an exception. I'll read Mark 10, verse 11. Whoever divorces his wife and marries someone else commits adultery against her. No exception. Verse, uh, chapter Luke. Uh, chapter Luke. Luke chapter 16, verse 18. For example, a man who divorces his wife and marries someone else commits adultery. So again, no exception. You go to Paul and the Pauline epistles, every time he talks about marriage and divorce, no exception. But why in Matthew, Jesus says, unless, Matthew 7, verse 31, but I say that a man who divorces his, his wife, unless she has been unfaithful, causes him to commit adultery, there is an exception. It's, it's adultery. If it's adultery, then you can divorce. Ah, so he, here's where the scholars come in and say, let's study the word unfaithful or adultery. The Greek word is porneia, and it's a, not a very common word for adultery. So scholars are now proposing this, that perhaps what Jesus was talking about was a specific kind of adultery. It's the adultery before consummation. And it's applicable only during the time of Jesus, because in the time of Jesus, in ancient Israel, a man, uh, this is what sometimes happened, common, very common, the man and the woman gets married, you know, wedding ceremony and all, and then the woman goes back to her home. And then the man goes and builds his house. So there's no consummation yet, no honeymoon yet, in other words. And then after a year or sometime later, the man will pick up his bride and then, you know, from, from her house and, and, and go to the, to the new house. So it is possible that Matthew was referring to this because he was the only one, the God, only gospel writer who would talk about Joseph, the foster father of Jesus, thinking about divorcing Mary a few chapters before chapter 5. And my point is this. Jesus was not siding with Hillel, obviously, nor was he siding even with Shammai. What Jesus was doing was he was revealing the heart of God for this law, that, that God loves family. God loves marriage. The value of family and marriage in the heart of God is right there in the very center. And I want to say that to you. God loves your family. God loves you. And God loves your relationships. And God loves your relationship with your mom. God loves your relationship with your dad. God loves your relationship with your siblings. God loves you. And, and he wants you to value that as much as he values them. And he values you. And I'm praying for you. So, so maybe the whole question is, okay, how? How about? You know, God wants you to fight for your marriage. God wants you to fight for your family. How? That's what Audible talk about.
God bless you.